Greetings, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Global Communications, welcome. My name is Howard Diallo. I am the chief of the civil society unit in the UN Department of Global Communications here in New York. We thank you for joining today's civil society briefing, a virtual side event of the 66th session of the, Com of the Commission on the Status of Women, titled Nuclear Disarmament and Disaster Risk Reduction, Women and Girls in the Lead. We wanna thank, we wanna thank Pathways to Peace for co-organizing this event with us. Many of you know that Pathways to Peace is a civil society organization that has formal association with the Department of Global Communications and that it has a long history of fostering peace building activities and creating a culture of peace. Since its, its, its inception, Pathways to Peace has worked with the United Nations to expand awareness and engagement for the International Day of Peace, which is celebrated every September. Now, I mentioned that I'm really excited about this session because when we started uh, planning it um, a few months ago, we could not have envisioned the timeliness of the briefing. And in this case, it's hardly a good thing. We are witnessing yet another instance of military hostilities and a humanitarian crisis globally. War and the fastest growing refugee crisis that Europe has seen since World War II. Civilians, particularly women and children, bear the brunt of uh, conflict. We all agree um, on that point. And the current escalating conflict has resulted in thousands of, of, of civilian deaths, injuries, and displaced persons, and many that are scarred for life by the experiences that they're going through right now. And on top of that, the mention of putting nuclear forces on high alert and a troubling situation around atomic plants in uh, uh, Eastern Europe in Ukraine, all paint a rather dim backdrop against which we are meeting today. But again, you know, I want to echo yesterday's ruling of the International um, Court of Justice um, in The Hague and the ongoing appeals of the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres and many member states in this statement saying that this war must stop. We have seen examples of the devastating environmental and humanitarian consequences of nuclear testing usage throughout history. Today's briefing will feature testimony of a survivor of a nuclear attack on Hiroshima, Japan. It is a horrifying experience to go through something like this. Nothing can justify the use of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are the most dangerous weapons on our planet and pose an existential threat to humankind. Therefore, since the creation of the United Nations, disarmament has been a top priority of this organization. Ensuring peace and security and protecting the universal human rights are fundamental to the UN. It is uh, what we work for hard and what strives our passion. For me, today's session is a contribution to this great work. Today, we organized this uh, event to shed light on women's significant role in global nuclear disarmament efforts. So I want this discussion to evoke emotion and inspire positive action from everyone in the audience and the speakers as well. Now, actually, this is usually the goal of, of every briefing that we do in the civil society unit here in the department, but especially today, it is vital that we succeed. I say this as a UN staff member and as a woman of the world. We will discuss why women must have a unique seat at the policy making table and how the active presence of women, their contributions and insights can help bring humanitarian perspective to the forefront. We have an, immerse, an immerse, impressive lineup of speakers from various sectors. Um, I see that the um, ambassador from uh, Albania uh, just joined us and I welcome him warmly. Now, all of these people, including the ambassador, will share their perspectives and commitments under the theme of today's event. I'm sure that you're all interested to hear from our esteemed speakers. So with no further ado, let me introduce our moderator for the event, Renor Jani, a passionate advocate for nuclear disarmament. Renor is Pathways to Peace's um, representative to the United Nations Department of Global Communications. But much more importantly to me, He's a leading member of the Department Civil Society Youth Representative Steering Committee, which I have the honor of working with. 
Thank you so much. Renoir, the floor is now yours. Take it away. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Hawa. It is an honor to be here with all of you today and welcome to the Nuclear Disarmament and Disaster Risk Reduction Women and Girls in the Lead Conference, co organized by Pathways to Peace and UN Department of Global Communications, DGC, for the 66th session of the Commission on the Status of Women, CSW 66. My name is Renor Yanni, and I'm your moderator for our conference today. I am the program coordinator for nuclear disarmament advocacy and research at Pathways to Peace globally and in countries like Albania. I am also a Pathways to Peace representative to UNDGC and a member of the UNDGC Youth Representative Steering Committee. Pathways to Peace, PTP, is a UN designated peace messenger organization and holds consultative status with the UN Department of Global Communications and UN Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC. PTP provides education, consultation, and mentorship. For over 40 years, PTP has helped inaugurate several UN recognized global peace initiatives, including UN International Day of Peace, the UN General Assembly Culture, Culture of Peace Resolution, and the Culture of Peace Initiative, CPI. Pathways to Peace works in partnership with peace builders locally and globally on peace building programs that include nuclear disarmament, climate change, racial equality, and gender equality. Since its inception in 1981, Pathways to Peace has worked with the UN to expand awareness of International Day of Peace, which is held annually on September 21st. Peace Day has grown from a single event of a few hundred people into a global movement that reaches hundreds of millions of people. As established by unanimous United Nations Resolution 1981, it provides a globally shared date for all humanity to commit to peace above all differences, to contribute to building a culture of peace, and to create practical acts of peace with a year round impact. Peace is both an innate state of being and a dynamic, transformative, and evolutionary process. This is how PTP defines peace. Peace begins within, and as others discover inner peace, they will radiate peace and engage in a peaceful way of life. Our conference today is a result of a conversation I had with Hawa about another conference that PTP is having on March 22nd, titled Shifting the Nuclear Narrative, Emerging Voices Against Nuclear Testing. She kindly suggested to work together to organize one for CSW 66. And from there, we both shared many great ideas for the concept of today's conference that Pathways to Peace and UNDGC supports. I'm very grateful for our intergenerational work together for peace and nuclear disarmament. On July 7, 2017, 122 states voted within the UN General Assembly for the adoption of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW. Humanity and the Hibakusha survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, have waited for this day for over 76 years. We are honored to be hearing from a Hibakusha victim survivor of the atomic bombing in Hiroshima during our panel later today. At Pathways to Peace, I'm very pleased to share that we recently published a new research report on the Albanian public opinion of the TPNW. The study reports that 98% of Albanian citizens want Albania to join the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, TPNW, which bans the usage, possession, testing, and transfer of nuclear weapons under international law. The research also shows a strong majority, 88% of Albanians surveyed feel their country would not be prepared to handle a crisis if a nuclear detonation were to occur anywhere in the world. Considering their seat on the United Nations Security Council, Albanians feel their government should affirm its commitment to nuclear disarmament by joining the rest of the international community 
through ratifying the TPNW. Please visit pathwaystopeace.org slash programs slash Albania to see the full report. And I've also included a, uh, a link to the full report in the chat uh, for you to see. At this time, it is vital for youth and young professionals to assert their voice and actions for a world free of nuclear weapons. The current crisis in Eastern Europe is showing the need for global nuclear disarmament. We must work to put peace into action today. And now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. John Ennis from the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rinor. And thank you, Hawa. And uh, welcome everyone to this uh, truly, truly special occasion. And I'm really happy to be a part of it and to deliver a few remarks at the beginning. And I wanna start out by thanking the Department of Global Communications for inviting me to speak today. You know, events such as this are really essential for raising awareness about the global challenges to international peace and security. And also with all of you here for allowing different voices to make their views known. You know, when it comes to nuclear disarmament, it's really essential to have many voices in the room. Uh, the recent events that we've seen in Eastern Europe have clearly demonstrated why the elimination of nuclear weapons remains the UN's highest disarmament priority. There's no other weapon that has the potential to cause such human and environmental devastation. Along with climate change, nuclear weapons represent one of the two existential threats to our planet. As relationships between states with nuclear weapons continues to fracture, and as certain countries continue to make threats about the use of nuclear weapons while simultaneously improving and in some cases expanding arsenals, the risk of nuclear weapons being used has risen to a height not seen since the depths of the Cold War. Since that time, though, I mean, if we look at the the, the recent past, since that time, there's been considerable progress as the international, uh, as an international community in reducing the risks posed by these weapons. Global arsenals have actually been reduced by around 80% and have been on a downward trend for almost 30 years. And entire regions have declared themselves to be nuclear weapon free zones. And additionally, we've developed a verifiable norm against the testing of nuclear weapons. Unfortunately though, so-called great power competition has been reinforced by the emergence of new domains, such as cyber and outer space, possible new domains for, for conflict in which the development of increasingly sophisticated weapons threatens to undermine the gains of the past 30 years. Many have argued that because of current global developments, conditions are not right, right now for nuclear disarmament. But we in the Office for Disarmament Affairs, along with the Secretary General, we believe quite the opposite, that efforts to reduce nuclear risk and take steps toward the elimination of nuclear weapons are needed now more than ever, if we're ever going to pre prevent catastrophe. There's an urgent need for dialogue for transparency, for confidence building measures in order to avoid miscalculation that could lead to catastrophic escalation. We need to step back from the nuclear abyss and chart our way forward to a world free of, a world free from these inhumane weapons. The beginning phrase of the UN charter, we the peoples means that we all have an important role to play in this regard. And in that respect, no voice is more important than that of women. Unfortunately, women remain underrepresented in the disarmament process and decision-making. In most international disarmament meetings and conferences, only about one third of the delegates are women. 
and even fewer are heads of delegations. Uh, we believe this can no longer be an acceptable part of our work. If we're going to navigate the global challenges ahead of us, we need a diverse range of voices and perspectives in order to develop new and better solutions to achieve our common goal of sustainable peace and security for everyone. Women have made incredible contributions to disarmament and nonproliferation. And if you look at the speakers today, that will attest to, to that fact. At the Office for Disarmament Affairs, we believe achieving gender equality and disarmament and arms control is possible, but that it takes commitment, not only through words, but through action. And in that respect, everyone needs to do their part in that effort. At the Office for Disarmament Affairs, we recently launched the first ever gender policy and that policy guides our work in achieving the equal, full, and effective participation of women in all decision-making processes as it relates to disarmament and to explore other aspects of diversity and inclusion and to mainstream a gender perspective into our work. At the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs, we're keen to work with all of those dedicated to achieving our shared goal of a world free of nuclear weapons. This isn't a utopian idea, but really a necessary measure if we're going to ensure human, national, and collective security. And I hope you'll join us in that cause. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. I'm really looking forward to listening to the panelists. And at the end of the panel discussion, I'd be honored if, uh, you know, to be able to join in the, in the Q&A if possible. Thank you again. Thank you so much, John, for your amazing remarks and uh, important message today. And now we would like to play a video um, by the International Committee of the Red Cross titled, If a Nuclear Bomb Dropped on Your City, This Is the Reality You Would Face. In the first second, the white light is blinding, the heat immense. In the first day, fires consume the city and there's no way to fight them. The skin is badly charred. In the first week, those hospitals that are still functioning are overwhelmed and can't treat the injured. Others who seem fine suddenly fall ill and die from radiation sickness. In the first year, radiation has seeped into the water and the soil. Crops and animals are contaminated. In 10 years, congratulations. You might not have leukemia or another cancer, but many of your friends do. You fear it will come any day. In 30 years, you look at your children wondering if you've passed on the effects of radiation. In 70 years, you're still seeing your doctor for checkups. He says it's a miracle you're still alive. The humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons are horrific and span generations. It's time to ban them now. We want to thank the ICRC for um, being here today and also pr for providing this video. Uh, to share with all of us. Thank you again. And now we'd like to begin our panel, the intersection of nuclear disarmament, climate action, and gender equality. It is with great honor that we welcome His Excellency Ambassador of Albania from the Permanent Mission of Albania to the UN, His Excellency Mr. Ferit Oja. The floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you very much, Renor. Thank you, Hawa, and congratulations to the UN Department for Global Communications for um, uh, setting up this this very important event. And I'm so pleased to be to be part uh, of 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 this. Uh, 
As the world gathered for the 66th session of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, one of the most important events of the year, unfortunately, and it was mentioned, a war is raging in Europe. Ukrainians, including women, are fighting courageously for their country and are showing resilience and courage. They are suffering, they are struggling, but they are resisting because they fight for their country, because they have a cause, because they are fighting for their freedom, and we pay tribute to them. The consequences of such an unprovoked, unjustified and illegal aggression, the terrible reports of attacks on civilian infrastructure installations causing civilian casualties on women, the elderly persons with disabilities and children are of utmost concern. And we have had the occasion to speak um, uh, openly and forcefully about this in the council and we will be doing so this afternoon as well. Um, as we witnessed last week, um, one, we were just one inch close to a catastrophe of untold proportions in Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Um, also threats for the use of nuclear weapons that have been heard here and there, including from the top um, government officials from Russia are absolutely unacceptable. And it suffices to see that short video just to have a feeling of what might happen, of what uh, we might be confronted with um, um, by using uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, as, as, as they have uh, been threatened. Dear colleagues, despite the terrible situation in Ukraine, our world has changed and we have seen more and more girls and women in many cities around the world leading peace protests in the face of repression and a threat to their freedom, ensuring the full, equal and meaningful participation of women and the inclusion of girls in all sectors, including in security and disarmament issues, is and remains very important. It is clear that women are not yet sufficiently, and, and, and John mentioned that, and equally involved in decision-making in, in many fields, and one of them is, of course, the field of nuclear disarmament and disaster reduction. While no one can deny the significant efforts made by states and the international community to promote gender equality and improve the meaningful participation of women, including in disarmament leadership positions, non-proliferation of arms, um, controls and forums, the fact is that there is a lot more that needs to be done. Women involvement in an effective participation in disarmament related decision making process can only help the promotion and the achievement of peace and security. We must not see gender parity only as a moral duty because it is way more than that. It is an imperative necessity to increase efficiency, productivity, development and progress. And we can only reach the full potential, potential of ourselves, humans, if we only use our, all our talent and diversity. Everywhere where women are drivers of social, economic, political, and technological, technological developments, there is change, there is progress. And we have seen that in my own country. We are encouraged by the fact that considerations relating to the promotion of gender equality and the full empowerment of women are included in an increasing number of the first committee resolutions. Diversity is not only a matter of equity. Diversity must also and beyond and above all be seen as an in engine for growth and innovation. Strengthening the training of girls and women on nuclear disarmament and disaster reduction can inevitably increase the presence of women in the international decision-making process with the value added that women bring. Women can play a crucial role in preventing and reducing gun violence. They are a strong voice in defending the arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation agenda and must have equal opportunities in the decision-making process on, the, on these issues. Women contribute to practical arm control, disarmament and non-proliferation issues at the local, national and sub-regional levels. And Albania is part and probably part of a drafting group uh, and a strong supporter of the first committee resolution on women, disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control. Um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, before concluding, just a few words on my own country, Albania. We have made significant progress in women's empowerment and gender equality at all levels in the area of the political empowerment, participation and economic opportunities. And we will continue to do so because we have seen the real benefits of the talent and energy that women and girls bring. And just symbolically, in a government of 17 persons now, 12 are women. Speaking of disarmament, I would like to mention that the deputy chief of staff of the Albanian Armed Forces is a woman general. 
And as Rinner mentioned, regarding the foundings uh, of, of their study, Albania promotes universal adherence and full implementation of non-proliferation and disarmament treaties and conventions, and in particular, the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, weapons because it is, we see that as a cornerstone of the international non-proliferation regime and in, as an essential foundation for the pursuit of nuclear disarmament. We believe that MPT is also vital for the further development of nuclear energy applications for peaceful purposes. Let me end with this. We, I'm sure that we all in Albania and everywhere need to do more to ensure equal participation of men and women in decision-making processes on nuclear disarmament, as well as to strengthen their role in environment disaster and risk dis uh, reduction policies. It is about the consolidation of peace, security, economic development and progress for all. It's about using talent and energy that the world we all so much need. I thank you. And of course, I remain um, uh, with pleasure um, disposed to for any question or any other comments. So thank you, Rinar. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Ferit Oja, for your amazing remarks and for sharing more about what Albania is doing to, uh, to promote gender equality and disarmament decision-making processes. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And now I would like to um, very kindly uh, present, uh, give the floor to um, atomic bomb survivor um, and thank uh, from Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, um, Yoshiko Kajimoto, thank you. みなさん、こんにちは。私は梶本よしこと申します。当時14歳、中学3年生でした。爆心地より2.3キロ来たで飛行機のプロペラ部品を作る作業中に被爆しました。Hello everyone. My name is Yoshiko Kajimoto. I was 14 years old and in my third year of middle school. When the bomb exploded, my classmates and I were assembling propeller parts for airplanes 2.3 kilometers north of the hypocenter. All of a sudden, a blue light blew through the windows. We are bombed, I thought as the factory collapsed, burying us underneath. I lost consciousness. 友達の悲鳴で気がつき、周りは真っ暗で材木、瓦礫に埋まり、身動きできません。無我夢中で這い出た時、向こう爪は避け、大量の出血がありました。右腕はガラスが何個か刺さり出血していました。When the screams of my classmates pulled me back, I found myself in pitch darkness, fully trapped in heaps of timber and roof tiles. I began crawling with all my might and managed to crawl through the wreckage. Blood was spewing from a gush in my shin. My right arm was pierced with broken glass and bleeding. I made my way into the open. Through the dim, dusky light, I saw that every building in the area was toppled. A stink like rotten fish filled the air. All my classmates had sustained grave injuries. Some couldn't even stand. As fires began to break out, we loaded those who couldn't walk onto stretchers and fled. 途中、全身焼かれて、男女の区別もわからない、髪は逆立ち、顔は倍くらい膨れ、唇は垂れ下がり、両手を前に出し、その先には焼けた皮がぶら下がって、お化けのような人たちが並んできます。このような人とは思え
burned faces, enormously swollen, scorched lips sagging heavily, holding up their arms with burned, peeling skin hanging from them, they trudged slowly along. This ghostly procession was not of this earth. It was a scene from hell. 翌日には死体が腐り、体にウジ虫が湧き、軍人らしい人が焼却します。至るところで白い煙が立ち、広島は火葬場です。人を焼く臭い匂いが体や服に染みついて、当分取りませんでした。The next day, the flesh of the corpses began to decay and breed maggots. Men who appeared to be soldiers cremated them. White smoke rose everywhere around the city. Hiroshima was a crematorium. The stench of burning human flesh stuck to our bodies and our clothing. We couldn't get rid of it. Mikka go, Guzen, Chito de Aimashta. Chichi wa Mikka kan, Shitai o mekutte, Watashi o sagashte kuremashta. Hontani ureshkata desu. Shikashi Chichi wa sono toki abita ho shasen de, Ichi nen han go, Tokezu shi, Mamo naku naku nari mashta. Three days later, I ran into my father. He had been turning over corpses looking for me. What a joy. However, because of high levels of radiation he absorbed during that search, a year and a half later, he vomited blood and died. 私は帰宅後、高熱が出て、歯茎から大量の出血があり、腕の傷から7個のガラスを取り出してもらい、生きることができました。When I got back to my home, I suffered high fever and bled profusely from my gums. Seven pieces of glass were extracted from the wounds of my arm, but I survived. 母は20年間苦しみながら原爆症で亡くなりました。私は1999年に癌のため胃を3分の2摘出しました。友人も大方癌で亡くなっています。また放射線のため77年経った今も白血病、がんで苦しんでいます。My mother suffered from A bomb related disorders for 20 years before she passed. In 1999, two thirds of my stomach had to be removed because of malignant tumors. Many of my classmates have died of cancer. Even 77 years later, cancers and leukemia caused by radiation exposure still plague survivors. このような恐ろしい核兵器はこの世に存在してはならないんです。またこのような苦しみを子どもたちに、そして世界の誰にもさせてはいけないんです。そのため、各国の指導者の方は、ぜひ広島の資料館に来てください。被爆者の体験を聞いてください。それでも核兵器は必要ですか We cannot allow these horrifying nuclear weapons to exist on this earth. Neither can we allow our children or anyone on earth to suffer as we have. I want leaders in every country to come to Hiroshima and listen to the stories of the Hibakusha. Then I want to ask them Will you still continue to insist that nuclear weapons are necessary? そのため、微力ながら日夜証言に励んでおります。ありがとうございました。One person's strength may be meager, but with the collective power of all who seek peace bolstered by the spirit of the departed Hibakusha, I know we can rid this world of nuclear weapons. However modest my contribution, for as long as I can, I will continue to tell my story. Thank you very much. ありがとうございました。We are deeply grateful and,、um, and honored for your testimony, Yoshiko Kajimoto.、Um, arigato. And we thank the Himo-、uh, Hiroshima Peace、uh, Memorial Museum as well. Now,、um, I would like to、uh, pass the floor, bring the floor to、um, and introduce. Beatrice Finn, Executive Director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN. Beatrice, it is an honor to have you, and the floor is yours.
I think um, I think Beatrice is maybe logging on or uh, she's having uh, trouble. It appears as if she has is not here now. So I guess in the meantime, we could go to um, the next speaker until. Okay. He Thank you. So now we will go to our next speaker, uh, Veronique Cristori, Senior Arms Control Advisor from the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC. Veronique, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I am delighted to be with you for this timely event on the margin of the CSW. Thank you for the invitation. Everything is said in the title, nuclear disarmament and risk reduction, women and girls in the lead, is the reason why we are here today and together. I would like to begin to read four sentences of the first telegram that was sent by the ICRC after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, when there was no TV, no social media, a piece of archive in the horrifying history of humanity. Thanks Yoshiko Kajimoti also for sharing your very important testimony. I quote, thousands of people in the street died like flies. We witness a sight totally unlike anything we have ever seen before. The center of the city was a sort of white patch, flattened and smooth like the palm of a hand. The slightest trace of, you, of houses seems to have disappeared. Every living thing was petrified in an attitude of acute pain. I gave a copy of the integral telegram to a delegation of Ibakusha when they came to New York in 2015 to deliver a petition with millions of signatures to call on a ban of nuclear weapons. It was a very poignant moment. The ICRC witnessed firsthand the apocalyptic impact of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. To give you an example, 80% of doctors and 90% of nurses were killed. Today, the Japanese Red Cross Hospital are still treating patients from the radiation, as you have seen in the video. My first point is as the following. We cannot allow a repetition of this dark past. Nuclear weapons threaten irreversible harm to the environment and to future generations. As previous speaker alighted, they threaten the very survival of humanity. We know that a nuclear explosion could cause insurmountable challenge to humanitarian assistance. No state or humanitarian organization is prepared to the enormous needs that a nuclear explosion would create. What we cannot prepare for, what we cannot respond to, we must prevent. Last Monday, the ICRC urgently appealed to state to ensure that nuclear weapons are never used again. The introduction of nuclear weapons renders armed conflict significantly more dangerous and risks a global conflagration in which humanity will suffer, will suffer irreparably. This is a wake-up call on the call of utmost caution. My second point, there is a beacon of hope. The entry into force of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in January 2021 sent a powerful message. The use of nuclear weapons is unacceptable. Nuclear weapons are unacceptable as a mean of warfare, unacceptable from a moral, humanitarian, and now legal perspective. As mentioned by previous speaker, the TPNW become the first instrument to help mitigate the catastrophic humanitarian consequence of nuclear weapons, notably by requiring state to help victims of nuclear testing and use and clearing contaminated areas. In its preamble, and it's very important, the TPNW recognized the equal, full, and effective participation of both women and men as essential for the promotion and attainment of sustainable peace and security, including the effective participation of women in nuclear disarmament. On a personal note, I participated in the negotiation of, the, of this historic treaty. 
exceptional woman head delegation. The conference was chaired by a woman, Ambassador White uh, of Costa Rica. Uh, many women participated in civil society like ICANN, Iba Kusha, the high representative uh, Mrs. Nakamitsu, and many other play a key role. To be honest, without women, I'm not sure that the treaty would have been adopted. I mean, they, they were a sense of purpose that I uh, never felt in other negotiation, and I participated in a in a negotiation of uh, prohibiting or regulating weapon in the last twenty five years, in the past twenty five years. But it was it was something very different for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapon, and I think one of the key elements is the, the role of women. Uh, the, I would like also to say that the, the TPNW also acknowledged the disproportionate, uh, disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on women and girls and called on all state parties to provide gender sensitive victim assistance. And that is in Article 6, and that is a very important element. Stark evidence continues to emerge on the sex and age differentiated impact on ionizing radiation on human health, in particular, the disproportional impact on women and children, the cascading effect on mortality, and notably in new, an infant mortality rates. Research into the humanitarian impact of nuclear use and testing is necessary to inform our understanding of the unique characteristic of this weapon, the catastrophic impact of their use, to uphold the right of individuals and communities affected, to provide a crucial basis for humanitarian preparedness, to engage in more risk reduction. There is also a need for continued and scale up effort to research and understand the effect of ionizing radiation on reproductive health. We will also say to, to, to state that what is very important is that now states must promptly sign or ratify the, the TPNW. Pending uh, the elimination, all states, and in particular the nuclear weapon state and nuclear allied state, must take immediate state steps to reduce the risk of intentional or accidental use of nuclear weapons. In June, the first meeting of state party of the TPNW in Vienna and in August, the name PT Review Conference, will provide key opportunity, but also test for states to, to make tangible progress toward achieving nuclear disarmament, a legal obligation of the international community, community as a whole. Raising awareness, advocacy, research, decision-making, women, girls, and young people, you have a key role to play. The participation of women, girls, and youth in the MSP and NPT REFCON should be encouraged. I would be happy to stay engaged with you. To conclude, the only way to guarantee that nuclear weapons are never used again is by prohibiting and eliminating them. Seldom have collective action and concrete, meaningful steps to free the world of the dark shadow of nuclear weapons have been more urgent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Veronique, for your, your powerful remarks and for highlighting the humanitarian consequences and impact of nuclear weapons. Uh, I've just been notified that Beatrice Finn has joined us now. Um, I'd like to properly uh, introduce Beatrice Finn, who is the executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Beatrice, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, and I'm so, so sorry I'm late. Uh, it was of course the, the different time zones suddenly, you know, this week the US has summertime and we do not here in Europe yet. Uh, and I thought it started in 15 minutes. So I'm very, very sorry, uh, my bad. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, this is not only an incredibly important issue uh, always, but I think after these last few weeks, the issue of nuclear disarmament is really at the top of the international agenda again. And 
if you're anything like me, you probably are feeling exhausted, terrified, overwhelmed, and just generally like how much can we handle uh, simultaneously? Um, looking at war, pandemics, uh, racism, uh, global inequality, we are adding now some uh, food security issues due to the conflict and other things. It just feels like there's an overwhelming kind of flow of mass catastrophes like brewing to happen. Um, so I really just want to say that it's it's first completely normal if it feels overwhelming. And I think that this issue, and even though I've been working on this issue for uh, over 10 years, it's never been more difficult for me to talk about really, uh, because it's suddenly so close. Uh, I'm very used to describing what happens when a nuclear weapon has gone off, but finding myself, it's difficult to articulate it now because it becomes so, so real. So I just really wanted to start by hope saying that I hope everyone is doing okay. And I hope everyone is holding up mentally and able to process this kind of information and listening to these conversations because it's not always so difficult, so easy. And one of the things that I think is so important while we talk about uh, women and girls and young people and why that is a perspective is, is so important is really because of what we're seeing right now. This, you know, one person in a nuclear armed country that is threatening to start nuclear war and you know, we're looking almost at two men like Biden and Putin, and, and they have our entire faith in their hands and able to decide when they think it's the time to kind of start this global collective suicide that nuclear war is. And it just makes me feel incredibly frustrated and angry, uh, feeling like, you know, do I not get a say in this? And to, me, and, in, and to me, this is really why um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is so important and the work that civil society is doing and what young people are doing and um, in, in raising their voices in this, because we, we matter, everyone matters in this issue and everyone has a voice when it comes to nuclear disarmament. And very traditionally, it has been an issue reserved for kind of the leaders of the nuclear armed states, which basically is just nine men. But it's, it's their job to decide where, whether or not we get to continue in this world. But that's not really true. And there are ways that we can uh, change things. We don't have to just wait for them to make these decisions. And one of the most kind of fundamental part of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is really that, like regain some kind of control, uh, taking action ourselves, uh, doing something that isn't just waiting, wishing, hoping that these men in power would do the job and, and disarm these weapons. So, and to me, like, you know, you, 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 can, you can kind of say, well, the nuclear weapon states have not joined this treaty. And for me, I always try to tell the story about when the moment where I, was personally convinced that this was a really good idea to do because I wasn't convinced fully in the beginning um, that banning nuclear weapons even without the nuclear armed states to a treaty was, was going to work. And it was in Oslo about nine years ago when we had the first conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. And that was a conference that was really focused on talking about what happens when a nuclear weapon is used. And a lot of skeptics said like, why are you even talking about that? It's completely, uh, it's not gonna happen. Uh, it's just like uh, hypothetical scenarios and like no, nobody's ever gonna use, they're not gonna use nuclear weapons. Like it's just silly. Uh, the nuclear arms states themselves boycotted this meeting and said it was a distraction. And then really, this was, the, this was the first time the nuclear arms state had, or the nuclear weapon states had boycotted this kind of meeting. And we were quite nervous in civil society knowing sort of, will people think this was a waste of time? And the, it was the Norwegian government who hosted this conference. So we had a big civil society conference the, the evening before where the state secretary of Norway showed up and, and she described how the P5 had demarched Norway, the Norwegian government. They still stomped up to their MFA in Oslo and they had said, oh, we're not gonna participate. We're boycotting this, it's a very bad idea. 
And she kind of like described this and laughed a little bit and said, well, they weren't very convincing. And onwards we go and we keep doing this conference. It's going to be great. And, you know, the whole room, about, I think, four or five hundred people of civil society activists laughed at this. Like this idea that the P5 were like grumpy and they were just left behind and we we're just moving on anyway without them. And I think it was in that moment where I really understood the power of taking control yourself and not waiting for others to move, but to really act yourself and how in a way liberating and empowering that is, that we can actually control things ourselves. Uh, we don't have to sit and wait for others and feel passive and that the only thing we can do is ask them. Uh, and to me, that was really like understanding the, the impact that doing things can have. So when I think about how young people uh, can kind of work on this issue, I would really encourage uh, just doing things, that this is a way to influence things and we don't have to just sit passively by and watching others doing things, but we can just engage ourselves and do things and create space and power for ourselves. So that's really just what I wanted to share here. And I know we're going to have some questions. Um, and uh, yeah, again, just saying that, you know, I really appreciate being here uh, and spending time with a lot of people thinking about this issue at just this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beatrice, for um, really highlighting the importance of young people being involved when it comes to um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. But thank you for also sharing more about the treaty itself and, and the important role that we all have and the important role that civil society has had uh, for this treaty um, as a pathway forward uh, to nuclear disarmament and peace. Now I would like to uh, introduce um, our next speaker, Yolanta Kuzmierzyk Nikolek, Atmospheric Sciences Officer, International Data Center from the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, CTBTO. Yolanta, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> good morning, uh, good uh, afternoon, and uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, with you a scientific view into the intersection of the issues around nuclear disarmament, climate action, and gender. So I will share my uh, presentation. I wanted to share with you the CTBTO's commitment to inspiring girls and women uh, to lead and contribute to our mission of banning nuclear explosions in all places for all time. The toughest global challenges require us to make use of the full pool of talent in terms of women and men. Uh, there is a substantial empiric evidence that uh, suggests that uh, women are disproportionately more affected by nuclear radiation and natural events, in particular in regions where they don't enjoy the same economic and social conditions and benefits as men. There is a gender bias of negative impact from evacuation, displacement, and emergency measures during natural disaster, for example, hurricanes, flooding, tsunami related events, earthquakes. As part of the, the architecture of uh, disarmament and non-proliferation, uh, pro women contribute to the core mission of CTBTO and uh, also to civil and scientific applications. Uh, for example, women play a significant role in analyzing measurements collected by more than 300 IMS stations of CTBTO. Data collected by the IMS stations represent four technologies, seismic, hydroacoustic, infrasound, and radionuclide. 
IMS data may help to minimize the disproportional impact of climate change, nuclear tests, and natural hazards on women. For example, seismic data play a crucial role in the case of earthquake monitoring. Hydroacoustic data together with seismic data form the basis for providing tsunami early warning announcements. There are frequent underwater earthquakes and many of them have a tsunami genic potential. Not only seismic and hydroacoustic data can be used for disaster risk mitigation. Infrasound data can be used as well. Infrasound observations offer a range of possible civil applications. One of them is the capability of identifying explosive volcano eruptions that promptly release a large amount of ash into the atmosphere and pose a severe threat to airplanes. Another example is uh, of using IMS data for uh, disaster risk mitigation are radionuclide data supported by atmospheric transport modeling. In the aftermath of the Fukushima incident, atmospheric transport forward modeling has been used to predict which of the IMS radionuclide stations are likely to be affected by a radioactive release and to estimate the time of a first detection for each of those. The animation on the right is an example of such a simulation. They were produced until the end of this event. The animation on the left shows IMS sample categories in the time between 12 March and the end of this event. Uh, it should be added that Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant uh, accident. Yes. I'm so sorry. Um, your presentation um, slides are not um, showing. I think you need to go to the next slide. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Do you see this slide? Um, unfortunately, we're seeing just the first slide. Maybe. Um, um, We'll, 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 have, we'll have the PowerPoint put up right away. Just, I would just uh, so screen which, share. Which slide, which slide you, you've seen, uh, the, the first, only the first one? Yolanta, uh, just uh, continue, thank you. We'll share the PowerPoint with the participants later. Okay. So the, uh, the CTBTO Preparatory Commission has given permission to the PTS uh, to share IMS uh, data for scientific and uh, for scientific applications. Uh, it is possible. Uh, uh, it is uh, possible uh, to get access to IMS data uh, using a virtual uh, data exploitation center VDEC. Uh, VDEC agreement uh, have become uh, more and more uh, popular and uh, among scientists. And uh, since 2011, VDEC contracts have been signed by uh, scientists uh, from entities representing 29 countries. As of today, the total number of VDEC contracts is 174. Uh, the percentage of women scientists requesting access to IMS data is more than 20%. Uh, the first such a request we re received in 2012, and it was from uh, Australia. Uh, 
Uh, at the CTBTO, we are looking to identify talented people from across gender, uh, geography and generations. Although we are searching for talented candidates across the entire organization in particular, uh, we are also looking for women from the STEM fields. Indeed, uh, next week on 22nd March, CTBTO will be hosting a virtual career fair for women in STEM. We invite interested candidates to find out more about our work and how to apply. To find out more uh, and how to register, uh, please find us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter or Facebook. In terms of women, the CTBTO uh, is committed to achieving gender parity at the professional or higher category of staff of the Pro uh, Provisional Technical Secretariat. At the end of 2021, more than 36 of women were in the professional or higher category of staff. I also want to underscore the executive secretary's commitment to achieving gender parity in the professional and higher levels. Uh, this means that the organization wants to both attract and retain talented women. Our leadership wants to ensure that women have full opportunities to develop and uh, contribute. Finally, I would like to share with you uh, that we have two initiatives uh, to promote CTBTO uh, mission and the special engagement of women. It's CTBTO youth group and the pilot project. We are counting on them to advance the goals of the CTBTO. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Yolanta. And thank you for sharing about the intersection of nuclear disarmament, disaster risk reduction, and gender equality. I think it's very important for opportunities such as the ones that you've mentioned for women to be further involved in these processes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope that you, you've seen at least some slides of my presentation. Yes, yes no worries. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to now um, accept some questions that we've received uh, for all of our panelists um, to uh, answer. Um, and I, I was notified um, that that some of our uh, registrants and participants will be asking the questions themselves. Um, so the, our first question that we received um, is from um, Margot Lazaro. I was notified Margot Lazaro um, is uh, in the room. Um, and uh, I'd like to, to pass the, the floor to Margot Lazaro from the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development. Margo, the floor is yours. Okay, maybe she stepped out of the room. Um, we can always come back. Um, we did receive another question uh, from an, 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 uh, an anonymous NGO submission. Um, it is, uh, what can women and girls do? support and impact disaster risk reduction and the nuclear disarmament movement. So any of our panelists uh, are open uh, and, and able to maybe answer that? <laughs> I, I'm happy to give it a go. Um, so, um, if I understood right, what, what women and girls can do to uh, improve disaster risk management and prevention of nuclear weapons use, um, to support and impact, and the, yeah, well, I mean, I'm going to ask in, in particular for the nuclear disarmament movement. Um, I think I often see nuclear weapons as the sort of ultimate symbol of toxic masculinity, uh, this kind of um, almost uh, bizarre symbolism that if I don't get what I want, I will blow up the whole world. Uh, and where I think we're seeing right now an example of that in Putin 
basically saying straight out that you know I'm going to invade Ukraine and anyone who try if you try to stop me I will start nuclear war. So I think it's really important that we we challenge that narrative um, and that we kind of engage and work uh, on things like disarmament diplomacy, international law. I mean, we have this very traditional kind of perspective that um, I think it has to do with, with kind of gender roles that the sort of classic masculine traits as, you know, uh, threatening and, and having more weapons and that, that that's strong and rational. But of course, threatening to mass murder the entire world, if you don't give it, is deeply irrational. And it's very rarely in anyone's interest to actually use these weapons uh, at all. But at the same time, it's kind of portrayed as a rational thing. Whereas, of course, things like compromise and diplomacy and negotiations and international law is deeply rational uh, and, and, and useful tools, but it's almost portrayed as something naive and, uh, oh, it's never going to work. So I think it's really important that we, as uh, that women, for example, engage in this um, and don't let the kind of idea that weapons is always the solution, uh, especially when we see so often that it's not. Um, and of course, it's not about what happens right now in these conflicts, but what we've been saying for 10, 15 years leading up to those conflicts. I find one of the most frustrating things in this kind of field is that women are often those that are warning in advance, saying, hey, this is not bad, good over here. This, things are bad here. Like we're sending too much weapons. We are, you know, we are, you know, in an armament process. We are seeing these hostile leaders. This is not good. We should put funds on education, healthcare, development. And only when that, you know, when they have been ignored, those voices, um, and instead governments have done the opposite, then you sort of turn around and it's like, well, well, how are you going to fix it now? Uh, to, to, to women's activists, for example. And it's extremely frustrating. Like you should have listened to us 10 years ago. Um, so I think we have to also kind of really um, not fall into the trap to think that a, for example, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and engaging in that like, oh, it's going to solve Ukraine now, right? No, but had we worked on these things 10 years ago, it would have been this, you know, a much better situation right now. And I think that we have to look at it as long-term process. So I would really encourage um, women to not um, give in to the narrative that diplomacy, international law, cooperation is weak and naive and really value that as strong, that policies that are meant to prevent things from happening is lifted up as really rational and strong and smart. Uh, because so often we see that as, as uh, people don't take it seriously until it's too late. And it's been the same thing with climate change, with pandemics, you know, it's all these voices who warn about these disastrous things that will happen gets ignored until it happens. And then the male leaders are like, oh, I can't believe it happened. Who would have known? Uh, and all the scientists and the activists and the NGOs that we knew. And we've been saying this. So I think we need to kind of really Everyone needs to help, and, and I think particularly women need to express this strongly and, and, and mobilize and engage in these issues to talk about the long term, talk about the preventative work, uh, how we have to act before disaster happens, um, and, and, uh, and really lean into that to kind of challenge what is rational, what is strength, what is smart, uh, and not let that be kind of dominated by weapons and war. Just have a word on, on that. Reno, can I just add a quick comment to that? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, anyone on the panel is, is welcome to. And thank you so much, Beatrice, for reminding us to not wait for the crisis to occur in order to take action for peace and nuclear disarmament. Thank you. And anyone else on the panel is welcome to, to answer. Thank you, John. The floor is yours. So, so thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank Beatrice for you know, so, uh, some very inspiring words. And to actually just to tell everyone to look at the panel, the majority of the panel, look at these women, look at Beatrice and Veronique and Jolanta, that there are some really excellent role models there. And that also just a, a very brief point, 
you know, women have been playing an incredibly important role in the history of nuclear disarmament. Uh, women have been in the lead in most of the civil society organizations that, uh, that, that actually led to the treaty on, on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Um, you know, I can got the uh, I can got the the Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, Beatrice was, you know, uh, along with others, or was at the front of that organization. And you can go even back to the partial test ban treaty. It was frankly the women uh, uh, an important women's movement, the Women's International League for Peace and and Freedom, that really put pressure on governments to um, to. Uh, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry. No, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom is the oldest NGO active in disarmament. And many Habakkasha women who've endured social stigma bravely came forward with their testimonies. But the women's movement also was putting pressure on the uh, administrations of governments to stop the part, to stop the above ground testing of nuclear weapons. And if it hadn't been for that, uh, who knows when that norm actually would have been enacted. So I, I just wanted to add that quick comment there. Thank you, John. Um, Ambassador Ferit Oja of Albania would like to, um, to say a few things. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rinor. Just, just one, one quick word in, in, in just supporting what uh, Ms. Finn was saying regarding um, diplomacy regarding treaties, regarding conventions, because this is exactly what we do uh, at the UN and not only at the UN. And actually, uh, we keep saying that it's not the nuclear weapons that will protect us, it's international law. That's the best army, and that's the best army for the small states like mine and the majority of the United Nations member states. It is by referring to international law that we can better protect ourselves and protect the world. And more concretely, um, further to what was said by, by Ms. Finn and by John, um, um, the concrete way to really try to push decision makers to really take the right decisions is by including um, something that we do actually, by including youth in the delegations that go to the UN every September. And by their presence, they can also influence what, what our leaders say. And of course, the saying it may not be enough, but that's how we build that critical mass by saying, by repeating, by going to resolutions, resolutions go to treaties. And that's how we really advance into, into these issues, which are not easy, but still, this is how we have progress. This is how we come to, a, to really um, be not only being aware, but also really mobilizing more and more. And this is uh, in what we believe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, um, I, anyone, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else in the panel would like to answer that. Uh, otherwise, I will go to the next question. Um, our next question is, uh, uh, this is actually um, uh, my question from myself that I wrote here is, um, what can governments do to support survivors of nuclear usage and testing? Uh, happy, happy to start that one too, <laughs> if everyone is quiet. Um, it's, um, I mean, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is the first nuclear weapons treaty that acknowledges the impacted communities, the survivors of not only the use of nuclear weapons in warfare in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also the test sites uh around the world places like kazakhstan Marshall islands algeria nevada and in the us for example as well uh, all over the world there are different test sites um, and one thing that these test sites have in common is that they very often either occupied land or indigenous communities land and you can really see the connections here with nuclear testing and you know colonialism or racism, uh, where it was tested on land far away from the people in power that made the decisions to test these weapons. Uh, and also in, in land, I think that the people in power had very little understanding of, of how the communities lived and worked and 
um, I'm thinking about places in Marshall Islands, for example, and not recognizing how people use the ocean in these communities, for example. So this treaty is really unique, and it's building on other treaties like the Cluster Munitions Conventions and the Landmines Treaty that also have this victim assistance. And I think it's a part of new kind of UN treaties on weapons to really reflect that we have to use these tools to not only ban it for future use, but also help the people in the past who've been impacted. And uh, I think it's really, you know, one of the key things that uh, governments need to do, of course, is that now implementing these provisions, ensuring rights, uh, and access to justice for these survivors, um, making sure that um, we set up different, that we have more research about the impact. I think it's still a, a huge lack of knowledge about the impact of nuclear weapons to nations. And but also as individuals, we can help by sharing the stories, sharing information about these things. Uh, a lot of people don't know that nuclear weapons were tested over 2000 times. Um, they don't know that in semi palatinsk in Kazakhstan, uh, today, one out of 20 children born in this area are still born with a disease that can be traced back to nuclear testing. Uh, people just don't know how it's impacting in Australia, for example, where they tested on Aboriginal land, or that the dome, this nuclear dome in Marshall Island, uh, where they contain with cement over to contain the radiation from some of the nuclear weapons, is, is cracking due to raising sea levels. And there's nothing that the governments can do to stop it. They, they don't know how to fix it. There's no fixing. It will start leaking out in, in the Pacific. And I think that these kind of things that we can also do to share the stories and, and listen to the survivors, listen to young people from those regions who are um, maybe not have the stories from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the, the first hand experience, but are survivors in the terms that are growing up with these consequences today. Um, so I would really encourage people to seek out the organizations the networks, there's some really great um, network of young people uh, working on this, for example, Reverse the Trend, I think they call it a, a network for, for young people. Uh, and there's all many things, I can, I can look it up while I'm the next person um, talks and, and I can share it in the, in the chat. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Uh, we have uh, Margot Lazaro is now able to join us uh, for her question. Uh, Margot, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I have an issue with the video, but I had a tech problem earlier and, and thank you for uh, allowing me in a second opportunity. So Margot Lazaro, president and chair of the NGO Committee on Sustainable Development. And I'm deeply uh, concerned about this this issue. I've been involved with Mayors for Peace and so forth. So um, I, my question is, how can women be involved in counter cyber defense security to protect nuclear facilities from, multi, uh, from malfunctioning or uh, the release of toxic nuclear waste or weapons? That's my question. Thank you. Anyone on the panel uh, is open and, and, and able to answer that question, uh, um, or I can also uh, I can also go on to the next question. If none of the panelists have any words that they want to share, I, Margot, I encourage you to also include your question in the chat in case one of the panelists want to uh, answer that later on. Our next question uh, that we have here is um, what can civil society do to promote adherence to the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons, TPNW? Okay, I'll say, I'll say a word. Yes, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, th th there, there is so much that, that we all can do. And, and of course, the civil society is an important actor um, to, um, to, uh, to hold governments into account. And that's what they uh, do very well. And, and they should, should continue to do so. 
uh, but I think they, they should they should be asking for um, support for financing uh, of, of research because um, not not much is I mean not everything is known uh, into into um, the the real effects direct indirect and of course long term effects of of nuclear radioactivity and 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 other hazards so I think by being active by speaking by organizing meetings just like this one. Um, by by being vocal, by engaging, by insisting that there is more um, information into education in the mainstream, and 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 obliging governments uh, to, um, to to really recognize how important it is to apply international law. And when we are a party to the treaty, at least for my country, the treaty has supersedes the national legislation. So that's really important, and that's the way how these international commitments become part of the legislation and become part of the implementation in, uh, through different laws by laws regulations. So this is what the, uh, the civil society should do. I mean, that's my modest opinion. Well said, Ambassador. Um, and and, and uh, of course, uh, Pathways to Peace is very honored that we recently published our report um, on the Albanian public opinion of the TPNW, which, strong, which shows a strong majority support uh, uh, for Albania to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. If just I could just say a quick word on, on, on top of that, um, just to say that civil society was absolutely instrumental in the TPNW becoming a reality, and they should continue to push to have their voices heard at the official meetings of the uh, TPNW. They should push to make sure that they are given a, an opportunity to speak and participate in the meetings of the state's parties, um, you know, whether formally or even if some governments want to include civil society participants as part of their delegations, registering them into the delegation uh, uh, that's going to be coming to, to the official meetings. And make sure that they 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 absolutely keep holding governments uh, to account for um, for the uh, for for moving the treaty forward. Thank you, John. Beatrice, would you like to say anything? I felt like I have talked so much already, but I think Veronique <laughs> uh, wants to speak. Uh, and I, I just agree with the two uh, speakers and I put uh, our website in the chat and also follow us on social media to kind of see the the, the stuff that we do, uh, can people, how people can be involved. That's also a tip. Thank you. Veronique? Um, your, your microphone is on mute. You just have to unmute your microphone. <laughs> we can always uh, circle back. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was written, but they couldn't unmute myself. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. I think that, that what is very important is it's really to uh, to raise awareness and, and to do advocacy and and uh, and to uh, to be engaged at whatever level you are, I mean, research, if you are doing a master's degree, for example, we need, a, we need much more data research on the, on the impact of nuclear weapon. So if you are studying international relation or, or you are a medical student, we are working also with nurse, uh, with um, international physician against nuclear war. I think that there is a, a great need to have much more people involved and uh, put pressure on their government, uh, on their parliamentarian um, to uh, to join the, the treaty on the prohibition of uh, nuclear weapon. And I think that it's a, a very uh, uh, individual, but also a collective role. So, uh, and you know, I am a mother of four kids and uh, I always been involved, for example, uh, in the school of my children, um, to, um, to, to go in classes and to explain uh, uh, with uh, age appropriate words uh, the, the, the importance of nuclear disarmament, uh, watch documentary. Uh, I brought uh, 
Uh, Ibakusha to uh, to the lycée in New York, and, and after the survey at the at the end of the year, they said that it was the most moving event and more powerful event they participated in. And I think that there were like thirty events in the year. So I think that we all need uh, to push boundaries uh, to challenge um, and to challenge governments and also uh, you can go also through um, the Red Cross and Red Crescent Society push in your country uh, even uh, for states uh, they are not willing to uh, to join the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapon I think that it's very important to engage uh, with your national uh, Red Cross and uh, Red Crescent Society and because they have a key role, I mean, one of the first uh, resolution uh, that was pushing for the for the ban treaty was through the, the movement under, of the Red Cross and the Red Cross and society. And as a reminder, the first call to a bad nuclear weapon was done by the ICRC in September 1945. So I think that uh, there are many opportunities, but we need to seize them. Thank you so much, Bernie. Uh, our next question uh, we have here from uh, Emma Schapmeyer, um, uh, representing Columbia University. Uh, Emma, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So my question is, uh, what is the role of youth in global nuclear disarmament efforts? And how can we ensure their voices are included and supported at the policy level, make, uh, at the policy making level? Thank you. Um, I'm happy to <laughs> Start this one as well, because I, I think youth is really absolutely essential. Um, and I think that right now you have a whole new generation that is discovering the nuclear threat. Uh, I mean, there are many young people who have been worried about this before, of course, have been active in ICANN and other organizations. But I think that now it's, it's really on, on people's minds. And if you think about it, you know, teenagers today will probably live for as long as nuclear weapons have already existed. So nuclear weapons have existed for what, 77 years. Uh, and many teenagers will, will you know, live for another 77 years. Uh, meaning that it's not, un if we keep nuclear weapons for all that time, it is not unlikely that they'll see nuclear weapons being used eventually. If we're gonna double the amount of time that nuclear weapons have been around. So I just, you know, when you put it like that, um, and there was a, a, a statistic, statistician, whatever that's called, sorry, um, that at Stanford that calculated the risk of nuclear weapons and concluded that the risk for a child born today to see nuclear war is, it's more likely that the ch a child born today will see nuclear war than not. And when you put it like that, and you're just looking at babies, and just thinking that it's more likely than not that they will experience nuclear war. It, it's just really, it brings you sort of like, someone's gonna have to deal with the consequences of this unless we do something about it. Uh, and I think that that's where young people really have a responsibility to, to sort of like, you know what, we, we're going to fix this problem. Uh, and you know, there's, a, there's been a lot of people in the past who have worked to take an enormous amount of steps. It doesn't feel like it always, but we are not starting from scratch. There's been movements since 1945 working on this. And they have, as we heard earlier, they have a partial test ban treaty. They have developed the MPT, for example. They have developed the comprehensive test ban treaty. They have developed you know, all of these kind of instruments and tools down to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. We've also developed things like the Geneva Conventions, the UN Charter, you know, we've ha we have made all of these accomplishments. And yes, it feels like a really dark and heavy time, but it's possible and we need to, we need young people to build onto that. Um, the first thing to do for young people, I think is to um, remember that you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have a PhD in nuclear physics to have an opinion about the nuclear weapon. Uh, and, uh, and the discourse around nuclear weapons, something we are trying to 
you know, change is extremely technical, extremely sort of like, it's numbers of missiles and it's like acronyms and it's all of these complicated things. And if you don't understand that, then you don't have an opinion. And I think that's completely wrong. All you need to know is nuclear weapons are a really big bomb that creates awful consequences for human beings and shouldn't exist. That's basically what you need to know. Um, it, it's pretty simple. Uh, and to kind of remember that and say like, I, I deserve to have a say about this because it's actually my life. And even if I'm not from one of the nine countries with nuclear weapons, they, uh, they have nuclear weapons, I still deserve a say in the future of humanity. Uh, so kind of feeling that empowerment. Uh, and then there's a lot of different youth network. I mentioned um, Reverse the Trend There's a youth network. Uh, there's a group called Youth for TPNW that at the first meeting of states parties of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Weapons, is going to be in Vienna this summer. They are organizing a youth conference, bringing youth from all over the world and encouraging young people to show up in Vienna and to participate in this, to learn from each other, connect. Uh, I think that social media is a really great way in times where we maybe can't travel uh, so much to, to really kind of um, connect with other young people around the world. Uh, and to sort of feel like you're part of a bigger movement. Because I think that one of the biggest challenges to get to getting involved in nuclear disarmament is that you feel like your actions won't matter. So connecting with others makes you feel like you're part of something bigger and to learning about the activists from the past, all these amazing groups of people who have done so much and actually saved the world from nuclear war several times in the past and building on to, them, to their work. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of things to do uh, and would love to see people visit the ICANN website, uh, check in with us on social media. I put some handles there in, in the chat as well earlier uh, and just kind of feel a part of this and feel empowered to say something about this. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Uh, Veronique? Yeah, I wanted to, to echo what Beatrice said uh, about the, the professor at Stanford, the ICRC, uh, did a survey two years ago of 16,000 uh, millennials, half uh, in an in, in, uh, in armed conflict situation and half in non-armed conflict situation. And um, the, the results were appalling. Half of the, I mean, 70%, I think, of the of the millennial thought that they, uh, they will uh, leave uh, World War III in their lifetime. And more than 50% thought that uh, uh, they will be uh, the use of nuclear weapons. So there is a tremendous work to do um, to really uh, eliminate uh, this uh, nuclear weapon and to be vocal. And, uh, and in very different fields. So I think that uh, whether you are a musician, you can compose a, a piece uh, about nuclear disarmament, a physicist, uh, data analysis, and, and uh, research on uh, reproductive health. I think that uh, we really need a young generation in very different uh, field, in climate, uh, in, uh, in famine uh, assessment and so on to um, to be uh, involved so uh, yeah and as Beatrice said uh, we really need to to uh, to uh, to stop this narrative that uh, if you are not uh, an expert uh, you don't have a voice uh, we are all we all have a voice and also um, one of the the great example uh, also I think it's the uh, ICAN uh, city appeal and I think that it's it's a great way to uh, to be aware and to push a mayor in your cities, and uh, that it's at local level, but uh, to push a mayor in your in your city to to join the the, the city appeal uh, for the man on, on nuclear weapon. Thank you so much, Veronique. Uh, thank you for highlighting the um, the actions, the local actions that young people can take. Uh, to work with their local governments uh, and that can help them uh, in, in, in advocating and, and working with their national governments. The role of young people is very important. Um, and also uh, the thought of, of thinking of future generations and the importance of future generations understanding the importance of, of this, um, this work. And of course, 
we thank all those who have come before us, who have helped pave the way and have been advocating for this, such as the Hibaksha um, survivors from Japan and, and also many other civil society organizations for several years. Thank you. Um, our next question that we have here is, um, why is it important to include women in the promotion of nuclear disarmament? This may have been mentioned before, but um, I'm wondering if any if any of the panelists would like to share anything else. Um, one 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 quick word, probably. Yes. Well, I mean, just like in everything, uh, women bring a different perspective. They bring a different thought. They bring a different analysis. They bring um, a different feeling. So um, in this or in any other uh, area, um, we need to have women as active to have their place on the table. And of course, to do their part and to bring their opinion. So I think uh, there is not a particular reason why women should be involved into this. It's the reason why women should be involved in everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Well said. And now uh, I'd like to uh, and, uh, have one more question um, by Hiwat Dimelash from Lehigh University. Hiwat, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, my question is, what are the factors that make women among the most vulnerable to the effects and the use of nuclear weapons and testing? Uh, if nobody wants to go, I can go there as well. Um, well, there's been, uh, and it's a really good comment here from Ellen um, that um, I want to pick up on and just highlight that a lot of the research on the impact of radiation has been done based on men uh, as the sort of standard men. And, and we didn't look at how it impacts women. And what research now have shown is that, um, and I'm not, um, I'm not an expert on the actual uh, biology, but like uh, women have more soft tissue to take up more radiation, for example, than men and store it in our bodies and then therefore uh, get sick more often uh, from the long-term impact of radiation. Also our reproductive system is vulnerable to radiation, meaning that we've seen in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and on nuclear test sites, a lot of the long-term implications of being exposed to radiation, for example, stillborn babies, miscarriages, difficult to get pregnancy, uh, which not only is traumatic, of course, for, for women uh, and, and harms, um, leads to, to a lot of different medical problems and, and problems for the children that have been born with diseases, but also included what we've seen, in, for example, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a lot of social stigma. Uh, where a lot of where girls who were born in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, uh, in a society that was very, you know, where women's main role was to get married, have kids, did not, you know, had to lie about where they were from, uh, because girls coming from Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the 50s, for example, were seen as dirty and not good marriage material. Um, so it, it, it's very layered, these kind of, kind of problems, um, and, and really disturbs more research, more attention. Um, but I think it's very important and then very often in different weapons issues and war scenarios, when you have peace negotiations, if you only use men, if there's only men at the table, if it's only men at the negotiations, a lot of that, those kind of nuances and, and different impacts um, will be lost and will not be addressed. They will not be part of the conversation on how we solve these problems long-term and what the impact will be long-term. So I think that's why it's so important that um, just as, as other people said before, that women are involved in all levels of decision-making regarding this, both in the solutions and also the long-term kind of impact and, and how we treat those.
you so much, Beatrice. And and now uh, we will uh, conclude the panel. Um, I would like to share just a few things. Um, you know, I, I I really I really would like to thank each and every speaker. Uh, you gave valuable insight into how women, girls, civil society organizations, youth, and young professionals can take action for peace, gender equality, nuclear disarmament, and climate justice. I also would like to thank all the attendees who joined us today from across the world and for those that asked a question to the panel. For me, after hearing all of the presentations, I think that everyone can see the importance of these social movements. And our environment needs to be further supported. More women and girls working for peace need to be involved in decision-making processes in regards to nuclear disarmament policy. And may we honor the words of the Hibachi survivors of nuclear usage and nuclear testing through our relentless efforts for a world free of nuclear weapons. In terms of youth action, I just want to quickly uh, share more about an, initi an initiative called Storytelling with a Purpose Youth Interview Series. It's a project in partnership with UNDGC, Bringing the Globe and Pathways to Peace. We are looking forward to sharing the second episode of the youth interview series with my co-host Cairo Eubanks that will be focused on youth and nuclear disarmament. And I'm very grateful to be joined by Alicia Sanders Zakra, Policy and Research Coordinator at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Alicia will be sharing more about how young people can make a positive impact within the nuclear disarmament movement. And we do look forward to launching the episode very soon. In the meantime, you can tune into our first episode with former African Union envoy on youth, Aya Shabi. Pathways to Peace and the UN Department of Global Communications, DTC, would like to thank you for joining us for the Nuclear Disarmament and Disaster Risk Reduction, Women and Girls in the Lead Conference for the Commission on the Status of Women. I would like to mention that you can uh, send in a submission of a survey um, we have here in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to share any thoughts on our conference today, you can do so through the survey. Um, and we hope that this has given you inspiration, knowledge, and willpower to take action for peace. Thank you. <laughs>